talk about fire a little bit this morning. Everyone say fire. fire. That's going to burn right there. If you see it catch something on fire, let me know because I won't be paying attention. It smells good, though. You know what's annoying, though, is when you light one of these and it's kind of getting old. This one's new, so it's going to burn very nicely for us this morning. But you ever have one and it gets like it starts to struggle to burn? Sometimes it's like cheap candles. You know, and it starts to struggle and then won't stay lit sometimes because the wax gets so melted and it starts to kind of drown out the wick. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Is it just my, my candles? And so I'm always in there like, and you dump the wax out and then all of a sudden the flame gets real bright, you know. And then after a little while it burns down, you got to dump it out again and play that whole game. It's kind of frustrating, but this is a good one. It's going to burn nicely and it's going to smell good in here in a minute. Let's dive into the word, Mark 16, 16. I want to talk about salvation this morning, and I want to look at a couple areas of baptism that the Bible talks about and be very, um, I think, what I would think is practical this morning, but hopefully also stretch us in how we interpret certain scriptures and contextual things in the Bible. And I, I do believe that the Bible is line upon line, precept upon precept. I believe that God's word can be layered um, and you can get more than just one thing from one passage. Everybody good with that? I'm not talking about changing your doctrine or theology. I think absolutes are absolutes. But I believe you can read the same scripture and God give you multiple multiple layers of truth out of the same line. Everybody good with that? Amen. It doesn't mean that one's more true than the other or one's not true and one is. It just means that God's word is way more in depth than we realize that it is. Amen. Mark 16, 16, very basic foundational verse that says, whoever believes and is baptized, say baptized. baptized. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Say saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. A couple things I want to point out about salvation from the get-go. And you may disagree. This may shock some people. If you're new here, um, just bear with me till the end. Don't leave yet. Um, And I'll try to qualify all this this morning. But salvation is not primarily about you escaping hell. Okay? Okay? Being, quote, saved. Most of the time we interpret that or we hear that or we're raised to believe that in the context of being saved from eternal damnation and fire. Now, that's a good thing. Amen. Um, I don't want to burn. Amen. Everybody good with that? However, the primary mission and goal of salvation, the very fruit that it brings, the benefit that we have its primary benefit is not the escaping of eternal fire. Okay. Which brings me to the point of why is it then that most of the gospel, when it's preached evangelically, revolves around eternal fire rather than the primary purpose of salvation? And it could be because maybe we really do think somewhere that being saved is being saved from something rather than being saved to someone, which was God the Father, I don't think that salvation was ever meant to be preached, that the gospel was meant to be preached with the primary focus of where you would go when you die. Now, that's blasphemy for some cultures. That's blasphemy probably for the church that I grew up in because all we talked about was what happens when your eyes close for the very last time and you draw your last breath. Everything built up to that point. And what I notice is people who have that kind of mentality, and even still today, people who have that, I hope I make it kind of salvation, that salvation that seems to get kicked around, that's based on your performance, whether you're good enough in certain seasons of life or certain areas of life, whether you're uh, hot or cold, not lukewarm. It's always that lukewarm vein that tends to struggle, and they seem very uneasy, very unsettled. They're always afraid of God, and the fear of the Lord is good, and a reverent fear, but not as a fear of an abusive father because that's not what he's like. And we have generational um, kind of uh, experiences, I think, in, in church where literally entire generations go through their salvation, walking it out, just trying to escape hell and get in the door, but never knowing the true love of God. And that's the reason that he saved you. He didn't save you so you could get out of hell. He saved you that you could get back into the family that he intended you to be in. And the worst thing I could ever do in my salvation is just escape hell but never know God. 
that it, you know, you know, for me personally, after just knowing the love of God, what would be more tormenting for me isn't to burn forever, but to feel the rejection of God and disconnect from God. Because when you get connected to God, He's that good. He is that just satisfying. He is the wholeness that we all look for. Amen. Your salvation is way bigger than um, a destination. Your salvation was redemption. Jesus says in, in, the, in the Gospels that he came to seek and save that which was lost. And most of the time we think that's just people. But the truth is, seeking and saving that which was lost was the fallen identity that God had created them in. And so when Jesus comes, his mission wasn't, oh, let's see if we can get all these people um, out of hell and into heaven. His primary mission and primary message was the Father that they had been disconnected from. Because through the religious, um, you know, background generations uh, and, and challenges, interpretation, they had put this crazy filter through the law on how they understood God. And it was always fear, it was always hiding, and it was always no one's ever good enough. So I think it's a tragedy that people live in this age of the church and have to walk around with their head down in shame every single day. People who are afraid to go to a church because of fear of being judged because churches have unfortunately made it so much about your performance or what life you come from or what situation you've been in. We get on people because their marriage didn't work out and we think God can't use them or God can't love them or they're tainted or stained and that is garbage. We get on people who might have an addiction and we think, oh, you got to get all clean before you can get up close to the Father and really walk and God wants to get you free. No, God wants to get right in your face in the middle of addiction and walk you out of it. He wants to love you out of it. He's not intimidated by all the stuff and all the stains that the church announces bigger, unfortunately, than the gospel. The gospel was not something that separated mankind from God. It was something that included mankind. No matter where you are, he says, I can bring you closer and I'm not scared of your stuff. That's what salvation is. Salvation is the mercy and grace and the extended favor of God on my life to say, you know what? You don't have to be Jesus because he is. And if you'll just let me, I'll start to love you closer and closer and closer to being like him. You know what starts to hinder our salvation? It's when we start to struggle with our own awareness of our failures. When you start to let that thing separate you from the love of God. When the Bible clearly says there's nothing that can separate you. Right? That stain, that blemish, that thing that makes you feel not good enough. It breaks my heart that people can't go to a church on Sunday because they feel like they'll be judged. Should be the first place they can go and not feel judged. Should be the first place they can go with embracing arms and say we're all in it together. Amen. Salvation's good. Amen. It wasn't about heaven or hell. That's certainly a benefit. Everybody good with that? Thank God that it is. But it was about reconnecting you to the Father. In our salvation, there's processes, there's challenges, there's um, struggles, there's time. And what the gospel didn't do, and I have to word this cautiously, but what the gospel didn't do was separate. Yeah, I know, I know we're sanctified, I know we're set apart, and, and, and all that great, awesome truth, but it doesn't allow us to pick sides and get on the offensive or defensive with people who don't believe like us. You would say, no, well, you can take a lot of scriptures to make it sound like that, but then you also have to take a lot of scriptures who doesn't make it sound like that, and then you have to look at the Jesus who didn't model that. Jesus crossed every boundary. He crossed belief systems. He crossed avenues with people he shouldn't have been associating with. It shocked the religious people, but the world was absolutely getting set free. They felt love for the first time. They felt accepted for the first time. People who had spots all over their skin, who weren't allowed even near the temple, all of a sudden for the first time felt embraced from somebody who just simply wasn't too scared to embrace them. That's what Jesus was like, right? See, when it comes to salvation, salvation is not about separating just us from, quote, the world. 
If we were just going to be so separated from the world and play it safe while they all burned, then what would be the point of us still being here today? He could have taken us with him the first time, right? But there's a world out there who, whether they realize it or not, the very internal makeup of who they are is crying and groaning for him. You know what they're not groaning for? They're not groaning for this line. If you died right now, where would you go? If you died right now, where would you go? When the truth is a lot of people have already died. They walk every day in misery and depression and brokenness and judgment and shame and guilt and that's the reason they can't come through that door because church built this facade of we're better we're holy we believe something and everyone else is tainted they're the son of the devil they're the daughter of the devil right that's not what the gospel did and that's not what your salvation does your sanctification doesn't set you apart from being a representation of who the Father is. Never will it pull you so far out of the problem that you can't be part of the solution. That's why we're here. Amen? So I would say it like this. It's imperative that my salvation grows and transforms my life because some other people's deliverance is dependent on God showing up and who we are. But you know what God showing up and who we are is? It's it's having the same display of love, compassion, and mercy that Jesus had. It's having that uh, nature that he had. That although he could be confrontational and definitely choose truth and stand on it firmly, he also was a master communicator. He also listened to people. He also sat with people, even in the midst of disagreement, and could have conversation. He didn't have to hold up a protest sign or picket somebody's uh, agenda. He simply knew how to embrace people who didn't want to be embraced. I want my salvation to progress. The Bible says that we work out to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That means it's a process. It's not just like, okay, I got stamped and I can go to heaven someday. Salvation is something that happens every day in our life. Now, how many of you guys were baptized this morning if you're a believer? I should have a baptism service today because only half of you guys are going to heaven. <clears throat> baptized, right? Get baptized. How many of you guys were sprinkled? Anybody? Praise God. Now, people fight over that, like, well, is it a spritz? Is it a dunk? Is it, I don't know, just get wet, right? I, I believe the Bible is clear on immersion, but again, at the end of the day, it, it is a symbolic act of obedience. It's not making or breaking your salvation. I believe in water baptism. However, whether it's a Dasani bottle, a pool, or a cow trough, it doesn't matter. Just, just do it. Amen. Everybody good with that part? Um, but John the Baptist is in the early stages of his ministry, and he's kind of a, a, a wild cannon a little bit. He's, he dresses like a hippie, smells like a goat type guy, probably played hacky sack. I don't know. <laughs> One of those guys probably, you know, if he wasn't saved, he was definitely a Grateful Dead follower, loved the band. <clears throat> One of, one of those guys, but Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptized, and he said to them, You brood of vipers, I love this um, kind of thing. And sometimes we take these verses as ammo to equip us to be jerks, right? And so we'll stand on the street, You bunch of idiots, turn! And we hold up signs, and we call that preaching the gospel, but that's not the gospel. Um, that's, that's unintelligence with a good heart, but lack of intelligence. It says, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, for me, I'm not going to get on this this morning, but there's a model there that with repentance, fruit comes. And your repentance isn't always just, oh, I'm a horrible person. God, forgive me. I I'm definitely have those moments with the Lord. But more often than not, repentance for me is being in whatever area of life or this experience that we know that I'm in and being able to listen to the Lord and figure out what he thinks and says about it. 
To be able to say, God, I, here's what my mind is thinking. Let me change it to see how yours is thinking. Repentance is a beautiful thing and produces a lot of fruit. Amen. Verse 9 says, And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that, <clears throat> that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 11, and this is what I want to look at. I, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I am, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Verse 12, his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, if there's one thing I'm after this morning, I, I want, I'm just praying like God, bring another level of security to who we are and what that means. Bring another level of security to our salvation so that we're not so to and fro because when we're to and fro, we have nothing to model to people who need a sustainable people. Amen? See, I love who Jesus was because Jesus stayed who he was. He never conformed to what the crowd needed. He didn't conform to what the disciples. I mean, look how many times the disciples were trying to pull him off track or convince him that it should be a different way because that's how they had always known it. Jesus is constantly staying in that middle road of who he is, knows what he's supposed to do, knows how he's supposed to respond, knows how he's supposed to act. He was certainly tempted with every option that we've ever been tempted by, but he never sinned, the Bible says. Amen. It's hard, though, to know that sometimes our greatest enemy, as it pertains to the church age and becoming the sons and daughters of God, as the word says, it's hard because it's easy to make the whole thing about us versus them, good versus evil. Light versus dark. And that's certainly part of it, don't get me wrong. But what we don't realize is our greatest battle isn't us versus them, but it's us versus us. You know, my greatest struggle is me versus me. The thing that keeps God from showing up in my life isn't the lack of his goodness or his power or the existence of all the broken evil that's in the world, the thing that keeps God from showing up in my life through the process of salvation is me. Amen? Because it takes faith to believe that what salvation did over your life is what salvation did over your life because there's gonna be days, there's gonna be moments, there's gonna be situations where you don't feel like you've been washed in the blood. There's gonna be times where you drop the ball and you don't feel like the grace of God has you. There's gonna be times that you stand tall and you think, man, I just love God, I can do this, I wanna see people set free, I'm just like walking with your head. There's gonna be days where you turn around and you feel so crushed and broken. But the truth is, the cross isn't weak in what it did. The truth is it was sustainable the deliverance of God. The blood of Jesus is sustainable. It's not momentarily strong. It's sustainable. It's eternal in its function. So that when God says, this is what I've done for you because of the cross, you can hang on that word every single day for all of eternity. Whether you feel like it or not, see, this is what I'm after this morning. Because... Because, I, I, you know, like when we read the scriptures in James, it talks about a double-minded man, people who doubt, uh, shouldn't expect to receive anything. They're just kind of to and fro. They're like, man, I don't know which is which. I'm, hey, you know the doubt? Sometimes it's not, it's not a lack of doubt. It's like believing, quote, theology. It's usually a doubt in our salvation, our personal walk. Because it doesn't show up like, I know God's good. I know he died on the cross. I know he rose again. I know he paid it all. Um, but getting that truth to overcome my daily doubt of thinking that somewhere my failure trumped his work, that's where doubt is. And it's when we doubt in that, 
area of salvation that we're all over the place, right? One moment we're boldly at the throne of grace, the next minute we're like hiding from God. Because we feel like, ah, man, I'm just, ah. I see this especially in the areas of like ministry and leadership in the body of Christ because it's hard, it's hard for people to be um, serving in ministries where they're, maybe you're a volunteer leader this morning or on staff or something like that. It's hard because it, you, you have those moments where you, you just feel like you're not qualified, Right? See, people all the time, they struggle because they think they can't do whatever God's called them to do because they haven't arrived at some perfect platform yet or perfect existence. They don't have all their stuff out of the way. And I do believe there are seasons of readiness and preparation, but you'll never, ever, ever be perfect. You'll never, ever, ever, ever be, quote, ready to do what God's called you to do. See, there's people even in this room who probably feel like a hypocrite sharing the gospel with someone they work with or a friend in their life because that friend or someone they work with have seen their other side. Amen? Amen. It's kind of like sharing the gospel with that person you cut off on the street. Pull over, you guys are exchanging um, certain fingers and... You pull over and you realize, oh, it was, it was the pastor. <laughs> you're like, no, pastor, that wasn't a bird. I was saying, you're number one, you're number one. You must have just, you misinterpreted my finger. It's, it's hard to share the real gospel with people when they're people who have seen both sides of you. Anybody ever feel like, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'll raise my hand. Anybody ever feel like you've got two natures going on inside? You got this one side that's set the kingdom, bring the kingdom, and you got this other side that's like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with me? You know? You got this side that's like perfect peace, Jesus loves the little children. And then you got this other side where it's like, I'm going to tear someone's head off if they don't stop bothering me and talking to me looking at me, right? It's called duality. But what the enemy does is he tries to use that weakness against you, use it as ammo, and fire arrows at you to the point that you feel so disqualified because you've got this other side that shows up that you can't function for the kingdom of God because you're not secure enough in his cross to really believe that it trumps all your failings. See, I do know, and it doesn't empower my weakness. It, it actually calls me out of my weakness. I'm so confident that if people could really meet the Father and get close to Jesus, if they could just get close to the Holy Spirit, if they could know the power of what the cross did, it would start to set them free and make them feel like even though they're messed up, God can still use them, and he wants them, and he values them. Because if I don't know that God values me, I'll never have value for myself. And the number one reason people struggle is because they don't know how to have proper value. When you feel like you're worth nothing, you're going to struggle. Amen? The Bible says that John baptized in water. He says there's one coming who's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. Now, obviously, this was a, a little precursor. He was talking about what was about to happen in Acts 2 when tongues of fire fell, the room began to shake, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and uh, manifestations began to pour out. The church was then born, thousands were added, and there's this shaking not only in the room, but it extended far past that into the city streets. And for years to come, we're sitting here today because of that um, one encounter that uh, a, a handful of people had in an upper room. So praise God for that obedience that they carried. But sometimes I also believe that there's a baptism that happens every single day of your life, right? See, the word baptize there in the Greek means to immerse. I don't think that sometimes our immersing in who God is is just a one-time deal, yeah? Sometimes I feel like he baptizes me and then baptizes me again and then baptizes me again and then baptizes me again. He's constantly trying to dunk me and immerse me in who he is so that I'll stop getting so intimidated by who I feel like I'm not. Yeah. 
But sometimes it's that fire baptism that just is no fun, right? And there's, there's different things about the baptism of fire that I'm not getting into this morning. But I want to look at a very practical one because I feel like this is where most of the church still struggles in their identity because they feel like the weaknesses that they see in their life is who they are. And so they start out good following God and salvation. They turn their life around. Then they have moments where they're just missing the mark and they allow that to begin to trump. They begin to back out of church. They begin to withdraw from uh, other believers. They start to just feel like they're not good enough or they got to get their stuff together. Can't tell you how many people have told me, Pastor, I'm going to get my stuff together. I'm going to come back to church. You know what that tells me? That tells me, here's how I hear that. Pastor, I don't know who I am. And it breaks my heart because I know if they only knew who they really were because of Calvary, no matter what they were going through, they could still come in here and hold their head up high because his grace is better than their weakness. Amen? In fact, I don't think you'll ever be able to conquer or win against your sin or your struggle or your weakness without coming to that conclusion and that ability to have faith and security of salvation to say, it does not matter how bad it looks like I am. I will always conclude my truth and my belief on the word of God that the cross was good enough, his death paid it all, the blood washed me, and he got back up to tell the story. He's interceding on my behalf. He is the high priest who's given account for my name, not just for Sunday, but for right now. I can walk through this life Even though I'm not perfect, I can hold my head up. I don't have to walk around in fear and shame. But here's what happens sometimes I think that we don't we we misinterpret. And 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 I don't want to like rock anybody's world, don't throw rocks at me. I I think this certainly can apply to eschatological end time views, and you can put it there, and that's all great, but here he says, his winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing fork, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Right? You ever hear that in church? We heard this every Sunday in church when I was growing up. We didn't really hear about Jesus. We just heard about hell and uh, how bad it was going to be and how bad you didn't want to go there. Now I'll look back and I'm like, why do we talk about that so much? Because everybody that was in there was saved. But then I realized it was an insecure salvation that was trying to keep us saved. So we had to preach that every single week because somebody messed up, right? And we'd all take turns each Sunday. We're on rotation, like serving the nursery, except we were going to the altar to get saved again. Get baptized again. It didn't work the first time because obviously I messed up again, so I'd have to go back and start all over. That's called insecurity. That's called not really believing the word of God but believing your performance. Amen. Let's look at this other one really quick and then I'll explain myself. Matthew 13, starting verse 24, is a parable. And again, you can apply this to end time views, not taken away from that, certainly. But it says, Jesus told him another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. He went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The other servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? You ever feel like that? You ever feel like you're like pursuing the Lord, things are going good, you're doing like all your Christian ritual stuff that's supposed to give you that purpose-driven best life now, seven points to the kingdom-like manifestation thing, and you're doing it all right, you're eating a good diet, you're like, I mean, just checking all the boxes, you're going to all the church groups, you're uh, doing all this stuff, and you feel like, man, why isn't this working? Right? And we're like, ah, it's like so good, but then this like weird weed shows up, Right? It starts to kind of sprout. When other good things are happening too, we start to see this ugly side show up, right? So you're feeling good. You're like, man, God, I'm just going to work on my, I don't know. We'll go back to the road rage thing. I, don't, I really don't deal with much. I'm an aggressive driver, I will be honest. But I don't like flip people off or something like that. Um, only in my thoughts do I do that. <clears throat> 
But you could be like, man, God, I'm just working on all my anger problems. I'm reading your word and, you know, just putting those verses, be angry, sin not, don't let the sun go down. I'm just feeling good, like I can do it. But then all of a sudden, when I feel like I'm doing good, this other thing shows up. And then you get this heart and hope deferred makes the heart sick and we feel like, ah, it doesn't work. You know what exhausts people more than anything is when they try and try and try and try and try but feel like they're not getting anywhere. But it's the why do I feel like I'm not getting anywhere that I think God would ask the question. Why do I feel that way? Because the truth is when I look back on my life to see where I was to where God is bringing me to, I've come way more further. Is that right, English? Way more farer. I've come a lot further than I ever feel like. Why? Because I still allow the ugly moments to dominate my feelings rather than celebrate the big picture of what God has done. Amen? Didn't you sow good seed in your field? Why then are there weeds everywhere? Why is all this like bad stuff happening? Don't you believe in God? Don't you pray to the God who, you know, heals the sick, raises the dead, who's good? You know, like where, where is he at? If God, why all this bad stuff? Verse 28, an enemy did this. He replied, the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? Powerful question right there. Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I'll tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. Now again, most people unfortunately use passages like this as ammo. Because later on he interprets this that uh, the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The other ones are the children of the evil one. But here's what I'm going to tell you this morning. I'm I'm not saying there's not certainly that aspect to it. But what I am saying is sometimes even now in my own life, in my own salvation, sometimes there's always still that duality that you see the apostles even dealt with in the earlyhood of the church and probably never conquered till they left this planet, but there's still that duality that it's not just like us, the children of the kingdom, and them, the children of the evil one. Sometimes I feel like I am the offspring of evil just as much as the people who I would say are, quote, evil. Amen? Amen? I know that's not the truth. I know that's not who I am, but sometimes that shows up. What do I mean by that? I mean by anything that misses the mark of who Jesus was, probably somewhere is the offspring of who Jesus isn't, which is the enemy, right? And so sometimes it bothers me when we just take every verse and make it about burning everybody who doesn't hear And we call that the gospel, unfortunate. But I wonder how many times God's putting me through fire so that he can purge and burn off certain things in my life that he doesn't want. I know he does this to believers. I mean, you can look in the book of Revelation. I think it's the church of Laodicea. He's talking to say, I I, I dare you to buy gold refined in the fire. In other words, I'm not going to just destroy you. I'm going to purify You know what the Holy Spirit does? In our life, that relationship, that presence, and that anointing of who he is, it shows up every single day to baptize and constantly immerse and remind you of who to be and where to go. It's not there to condemn. It's not there to, uh, it kind of destroys that, that side of our nature, but it's not there to just totally kill you and make you feel like you're worth nothing. Conviction is leading, right? I wonder how many times we are so just squished by seasons of fire because it's hard, because it's challenging, not just the situations. I'm talking about our own true understanding of who we are in the Father. You know what an identity crisis is? I see this kind of on a, on a spiritual level. When we bounce back and forth between who God saved me to be 
and who my flesh is. And we can't decide which one's right, which one's true of who we are. That's an identity crisis. It doesn't mean that you're going to pick one side and stick to it, right? It just means that you allow one side to be truth and you refuse to let that truth ever, ever be trumped by the times that you switch to this side. When you come over here, you fall short of the glory of God. You just remember that the glory of God died for you 2,000 years ago. I know I don't deserve it, but I still got it. Praise God. Praise Jesus. Amen. I know I, I, I know I didn't earn it, so thank God that he gave it to me. Amen. And it's through that true identity uh, kind of confidence that we have a place to fight from. If you want to see sin destroyed in someone's life, introduce them to a father. Introduce them to Jesus. Tell them what the cross really did. The cross didn't happen so that we could just escape hell. The cross happened so that you could escape everything that was never meant to be you and be reborn into the family of God. That's why Jesus said, be born again. He didn't say escape. He said, be born again. Rebirthed into a constant awareness of who God is in your life. That's what baptism does, right? So it'll baptize you in fire. Sometimes I feel like that fire and tell me if you if this resonates or agrees with you about Sometimes when you're just going through that place of just like exhaustion, right? You're just fighting the good fight. You're fighting the good fight. You're fighting the good fight. You're fighting the good fight, but you feel like you're just not going anywhere. Sometimes it's because God's baptizing you. So I, I do believe that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. So sometimes, not that God may... Um, author a situation in your life, but we can certainly author certain situations in our life that he probably wouldn't have, but he'll still use it, right? And rather than get so frustrated and broken and lose your identity in the process, just remember that God does immerse and purify if we allow him. Does that make sense this morning? You know what I hear when I read that? Let me read this one more time for you. I don't want you to hear, like, just about heaven or hell. Everybody good with heaven and hell, by the way? There's a heaven and hell. Everybody good with that? We do believe that. I'm looking for the verse. I'm looking for the verse. Matthew 3, 12 says, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing for gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. I, I believe 100% that there's an aspect of who God is that is an unquenchable fire. Right? You know what that means to me? That means that no matter what all of my weedy side is, there's a good side, there's a bad side, there's this fallen nature of Adam still at work, but there's this glorious redemptive nature of Jesus at work now, amen? There's, a, there's an old seed, but now there's a new incorruptible seed. And they're both growing in the same field that Jesus planted inside of who we are. And he says, you know what, this is broken, but sometimes the ground has to be broken so that seed can be sown. Sometimes it has to be tilled up so that things can be harvested. And he puts that in there and it starts to grow. And I love how they say, should we go pull them up? He says, no. Wait until they get to a certain point, and then we'll separate them. That means that they were asking the question when things weren't mature enough to evaluate what they were seeing. And sometimes we're in the middle of a process, in the middle of a season of life, and we're totally judging it way too soon. It's not even had time to get to the point of harvest. And we start to condemn ourselves or condemn other people. We look at other people's lives sometimes. And they're just going through a season. They're going through a situation. They're not there yet. But we see that little bit of weed sprouting with the good stuff. And we're like, yeah, that's some good stuff there. But oh my gosh, they got some baggage. Right? And what we do 
right? Because we're supposed to disciple. Is we run to them and we start to pull on the baggage, right? We're like, oh my gosh, we gotta get them healed and signed, sealed, delivered, clean them up. Because we don't have the trust in the cross enough to know that sometimes it's not time to deal with the baggage. Sometimes the two need to grow together so that one's strong enough so that when you pull the baggage out, you don't also uproot. You know what that is? Sometimes you deal with somebody's baggage or even your own baggage to the point it crushes the joy of your salvation. Because you start to focus on all your blemishes, your stains, or someone else's. You start to disciple somebody else who just isn't ready to change And in the process of trying to do something good, you actually squash them because they feel so disqualified because of all the wheat, the weed that is in their field, that it crushes the joy and life of God in them. And that's why they leave the church, they close the doors, they don't feel like they're accepted, they don't feel like they can go, they don't feel like anybody likes them because they just had some issues in life. Guess what? We've all got issues in life. We all have issues in life. But don't try to judge the field when it's still in the middle of growing. So many parallels of this in Scripture. But I'm so confident that God is an unquenchable fire. And what that says to me is that throwing that weed into an unquenchable fire, all that bad stuff, the fact that the fire is unquenchable is evidence to me that no matter how much junk I need to throw in it, it will never put the fire of God out. His cross will never not be enough to just keep taking it and taking it and taking it and taking it and taking it. It, it, it's, it will scare you how just close the Holy Spirit is to your mess. But if you can find him in that, your life changes forever. When you realize it's not, it's, your, your stuff's not too dirty or dark or secretive for God to follow you into it, your life changes forever. You know, you know what helped me like overcome like sin when I was really encountering the Lord is when I really had a revelation that he was there because then it made it uncomfortable, right? You, who wants to go to a party when God's already there? He's going to follow you, right? You're like, oh gosh, this is weird. Think, of, think about this, guys. Not to be, I'll, I'll close with a couple thoughts here, but this, this is what he's like. And, and again, you can, we can't just tell the world, change what you do and be more like Jesus. If they don't know him, they have no, no substance to be able to change. They have nothing in their life, right? And the truth is, stop telling them to change. You change in Jesus' name. I'll never forget... Sorry, honey, I'm going to tell a pre, pre-marriage girlfriend story. When I was, I think I was probably like 14, maybe. Y'all don't judge me, kids don't listen. But, we, we, I mean, you know, what we did was we would go to the movies, and that's where we made out, right? And some of you, some of you people in here, you had like, you drive up to the hill and make out in your car. I didn't have a car. Um, I was too young for that. So we would meet at the movies, and we never wanted to watch a movie. We just wanted to meet, hang out, and, you know, kiss, right? And so I'll I'll never forget one night. (laughs) You guys don't judge me. (laughs) It's on you. I know who I am. I know. Look at how tall my head is. I don't care. And if you are judging me, guess what? I think you're number one let you interpret here, here, here's what happened though we, we went to the movies I don't I don't support this kind of relationship I was I didn't know Jesus anything I was just lost but I had been baptized okay and so we go to the movies and we're just make making out I don't know what kids call it today but we're just making out right and we came, I had one moment, I came up for air, and I looked. <laughs> I looked at the seat behind us. I remember like 13 or 14. This was the summer of eighth grade, so whatever age that was. I looked at the seat behind me, 
and my brother-in-law had come to pick me up. And I wasn't outside, so he came into the movie and looked, and he was just sitting there, just watching me and smiling really big. And here's what happened. Forever. That's pretty uncomfortable, right? Now, he was cool. He was kind of like later, like, high five, man, but, you know, like, kind of thing. But then you think about, like, what if that was my dad or my mom? That'd be uncomfortable, right? How many of you guys like to make out with your wife or husband in front of your parents? Anybody? Anybody just enjoy that for the holidays? Anybody? No one, right? Because there's this weird intimacy thing that triggers, and you're like, oh, this is weird. Or like when you're a kid and you see your mom and dad making it, you're like, oh, my gosh, stop. You know, like, just nasty, you know? What if the answer to the world's sin isn't that they just get it right, but what if it's that they get close enough to God and him close enough to them, and they're aware of it, to where when they're in their moments of makeout, they look up and see him sitting there. Because you know what that does? It makes, it, it makes following sin and brokenness so uncomfortable that I can't do it with him there. And what salvation did was it latched him on so tight that he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. There's no height nor depth. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. The psalmist would write, even if I'm making my bed in hell, you're there. He had a revelation that no matter where I'm in, where I'm at, a guy who had had his ups and downs, no matter where I'm at, God's there. Hmm. I think one of the greatest immersing experiences and baptism experiences we can have in our relationship and salvation with the Lord is being in those moments and really starting to get the revelation and belief that God's there. That's what the world needs, yeah? The world needs a father who just sits there when they're not good enough. That's what we need. Sometimes we need to be reminded that he's sitting there when when we're not good enough. He's just there, yeah? Let's stand. I'll close with this thought because I lit a candle and I forgot about it. This was going to be part of my message today, but I I gave up on it. Sometimes it's, this thing smells like a starburst, by the way. But sometimes in order to release what's inside of you, there has to be those seasons of fire. Lighting this candle, it it smells good, but its smell doesn't fill the room. The fragrance isn't released until there's heat applied. And as it sits there and burns, it starts to benefit everybody. Well, there's a big room for a candle, but me and Greg are enjoying it, right? As it burns, it starts to melt down all the stuff inside, makes it pliable. But if you're like me and you buy the cheap candles, sometimes all the melted stuff starts to drown out the flame and it doesn't want to burn. So I have to go and I have to pour it out. I won't do that. And what the cross did was It brought mercy and grace to the situation to redeem us back to a father who's so secure in who he is that he can walk with you even when you're not secure. And it brought us to the point of meeting who he is every day as the Holy Spirit. That through that relationship, God immerses us In all that he is, he wants to immerse us in compassion. He wants to immerse us in grace. 
He wants to immerse us in righteousness. He wants to immerse us in his holiness. He wants to immerse us in his mercy. He wants you to be immersed in his peace. But sometimes in order for the fragrance of who we are to really come out, for that sonship and that daughtership of who we are in the Father to really start to show up, sometimes I have to go through seasons where even though I sow good seed, the weeds are sprouting too. You know, the mistake people make is they burn the whole field down and try to start over. That's why I had to get saved every Sunday growing up. Because I judged the season too early. I judged the progress too early. I saw something that scared me. When I thought it had been changed, I thought I saw something that didn't seem to be changed, and so I, I abandoned. And that's because somewhere my salvation was dependent on a final destination and never the truth of a present relationship. And here's what I believe. I believe the greatest revival we'll see in this generation, this age, isn't gonna come because we get loud. It's not gonna come because we hold up signs. It's not gonna come because we scream repentance. It's not gonna come because we have signs or more programs or more churches. It's not gonna come just because we evangelize harder. It's gonna come because the groan of creation is crying for a manifestation of who we are. And it's gonna come when a people are secure enough to embrace the cross even in the midst of their challenge. To say, I don't have it all together, but God's good. To say, I, I'm a broken mess some days, but God's good. And when you can do that, it doesn't matter if you're going through a season of fire, there's an aroma that can be released. Something smells a lot better. There's a better atmosphere when you give glory to God rather than talk about how hot it is and how much it hurts. Yeah. There's people in our city and maybe people here this morning, and I'll close with this thought, that their greatest hindrance to the church or, or Jesus or God, whatever that first step looks like for them, their greatest hindrance is not feeling qualified or good enough. That's a tragedy. But I think sometimes they get that from a church who's still not totally secure in their own salvation. Because we make it about how good we're doing rather than how good he is.